Welcome, everybody. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm Director of the Policy Institute at King's College London and Chair of the Campaign for Social Science, which is part of the Academy of Social Science. <clears throat> and it's a, a real delight uh, to welcome you all to the Campaign for Social Science annual SAGE lecture in partnership with our great supporters, SAGE Publishing. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Campaign for Social Science has a simple objective to demonstrate how social science improves public policy, societies and lives. And is kindly supported by SAGE and the social science faculties of around 35 universities, as well as learned societies. And this is the flagship event in the campaign's annual calendar. Uh, and this year, it couldn't be more topical, um, exploring our political culture as we prepare to enter what is probably an election uh, year, almost certainly an election year. Uh, and we also couldn't have had have two more distinguished and important experts to guide us uh, through that. Um, this year's annual lecture will be given by Gary Young, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of Manchester and an award-winning author of six excellent books, as well as being a journalist and broadcaster, including winning the 2023 Orwell Prize for Journalism. Uh, and he's also, of course, a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, after Gary's lecture, we'll have a response from Jane Green, who's Professor of Political Science and British Politics at Nuffield College, Oxford, where she's also Director of uh, Nuffield Pol Politics Research Centre. Jane is also, of course, uh, Co-Director of the hugely important British Election Study and President of British Politics Group at uh, the American Political Science Association. Uh, Jane is also, of course, a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, so this lecture is a key part of the campaign's Election 24 project, which launched in September and is showcasing the vital role of social science in informing uh, public debate and policy development at this really vital time of manifesto building among political parties. So do look at the hub link, uh, which we're going to be posting or have posted in uh, the chat. We've already got a really extensive set of pieces and more events to come. So do keep an eye on that. Uh, it's a very simple format um, for the lecture. We'll have the lecture from Gary for around 35 or 40 minutes. Uh, uh, then a response from Jane for 10 or 15 minutes. And then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions from you before we wrap up uh, by 6 p.m. Uh, do submit your questions and thoughts throughout the lecture using the Zoom Q&A function. Um, do get them in early. We've got a lot of people attending the event and uh, earlier you're in, the greater chance you've got of uh, being picked. And the upvote, we do use the upvote, so do upvote other ones that you like. And you can also tweet about the event. Uh, we'll be using hashtags that you can see again in the chat from uh, the team here. So that's it for me. Before we get to Gary, though, first I want to hand over to Katie Metzler, who is Vice President of Books and Social Science Innovation at SAGE and a truly brilliant partner um, to the campaign. So Katie's going to say a few words from a SAGE perspective before handing over uh, to Gary. Katie. Thank you, Bobby, and welcome everyone to SAGE and the campaign's annual lecture. SAGE is an independent academic publisher and our mission is to build bridges to knowledge. And one of the ways that we do that is through events like this one, which are free and open to everyone, and that highlight the role that social science plays in helping us to understand and address the most pressing issues facing society. In 2020, our annual lecture was on the role of social science in helping us to navigate the post-truth pandemic. In 2021, it focused on reimagining capitalist institutions to support human flourishing. And last year, we heard from Torsten Bell on the causes and impacts of the UK's cost of living crisis. And next year, countries representing over 50% of global GDP will hold elections. And it's clear that all of these issues, misinformation, rising inequality, and the cost of living will matter as electorates head to the ballots. These challenge, uh, challenges aren't just national challenges we face in the UK, but global in their impact and implications. So I'm absolutely delighted to add my welcome tonight to Professor Gary Young and Professor Jane Green to help us think about the challenges that lie ahead and the ways in which social science can help us understand how we got here and where we need to go next. As Bobby mentioned, this event forms part of a series of events, publications, and activities that the Campaign for Social Science, with support from SAGE, will be running as we prepare for the UK election. So please do check out the campaign's website and take a look at some of the excellent content they're publishing. Through SAGE's publishing, through our Social Science Bite podcast series, and through uh, support of partner organizations like the campaign, 
we will do our best to highlight the hugely important role that academics and the principles of academic freedom play in maintaining a healthy society, especially in election years. We need social scientists and journalists and academic journalists like Professor Young to examine election processes, to analyze policy proposals, and to investigate the impacts of political rhetoric on society. We need academics who are free to research, evaluate and critique the impact of government's actions or inactions on people without fear of reprisals. And we need academics who can disagree with each other while defending their opponent's right to be heard. Academic freedom and freedom of expression are not static victories. They're dynamic principles that require constant vigilance and defense to maintain. These freedoms are never fully secured, they're always evolving, and they're perpetually challenged. So SAGE is very proud to be the publisher of the Index on Censorship, which is a magazine devoted to free expression. It's really our collective responsibility to safeguard these freedoms. So thank you to everyone who supports the campaign and the really important work they do to advocate for the social sciences and for the importance of social science evidence in policy making. And thank you very much to our speakers and to all of you for joining tonight. And with that, I'll pass over to Professor Young to give tonight's lecture. The mute thing never gets old, does it? It never gets old. You think after a year and a half of pandemic that uh, one would be used to it. Uh, thank you so much, Bobby and uh, Katie, uh, for your introduction. Um, I want to start this lecture by talking about my mum who came to Britain from Barbados uh, on the 20th of August, 1962. Uh, she wasn't an immigrant. She crossed an ocean, but not a border. Barbados was still a colony at the time. So she came with a British passport, which cites her national status as British subject, citizen of the United Kingdom and colonies. When Barbados became independent, the border crossed her. The black and white picture inside her passport, which I found not so long ago, is of a teenager, just 19, high hopes, high cheeks and high hair, with dark skin against a crisp white cotton blouse. She had been training to be a teacher in Barbados, but when the call came from London, it advertised for nurses. That was where the shortage was. This fledgling innovation, the National Health Service needed shoring up, and so they appealed to the colonies. They must have been desperate. They paid her passage up front, and then she paid it back every month, bit by bit, from her wages. But my mum arrived just a month after the Commonwealth Immigrants Act came into being. This was indeed a milestone, for that act set the terms under which immigration and race would be discussed and misrepresented in Britain for more than a generation. Even Labour leader Hugh Gateskill, no radical he, branded the act a cruel and brutal piece of anti-colour legislation. The racism inherent in that particular act was not a glitch in an otherwise fair system. It was the system, but it was popular. The month the act was passed, a Gallup poll revealed 67% of Britons were in favour of the restrictions, 6% for a total ban on Commonwealth immigration and 21% for continued free entry. Once it was law, whatever Labour felt about it, then they never repealed it. The trouble was that Britain had other needs too. Unemployment that year was on average just 2%. In other words, the labour market was as tight as a drum. Meanwhile, the NHS was in need of reorganisation. In the five years prior to my mum coming, spending on hospital building rose from 10 million to 31 million pounds. Six months before she arrived, the then health minister, one Enoch Powell, produced a 10-year hospital restructuring programme with estimated capital costs of £500 million. But one corollary of all this reorganisation was clear. These new hospitals and this huge plan needed workers that could not be found on mainland Britain. And so they looked abroad. To put it bluntly, at the very moment when British racism decreed that there should be fewer people from the colonies, the British, inco British economy in general, and the health service in particular, needed more labour, and the British government went to the colonies to get it. Not for the first time, and certainly not the last, Britain had grown dependent on the very thing it claimed to despise, migrant labour. But needs must. Nurses were imported from all over the empire and former colonies, as were other medics. All of my aunts who came to Britain, and there were four of them, 
came as nurses. By 1971, two years after the troops went into the north of Ireland, 12% of nurses in Britain were Irish born. By the turn of the century, 73% of GPs in the Welsh Rhondda Valley and 71% in nearby Sinon Valley were South Asian. During the general election, which took place two years after my mum arrived, the issues of race and immigration were front and centre. And why wouldn't they be? Less than a decade earlier, Winston Churchill had suggested that the Conservatives go to the polls with the slogan, Keep Britain White. During the 1964 election, Harold Wilson spent a day campaigning in London marginals, addressing crowds from the back of a lorry. Immigration and even repatriation invariably came up. Wilson faced the hecklers down. Whom should we send home, he asked. The nurses in our hospitals, the people who drive our buses, where would our health service be without the black workers who keep it going? According to the late Paul Foote, these questions were greeted with roars of approval from the crowd and the hecklers. Labour won the election nationally with a 3.5% swing, but the swing was not uniform. And this is a trigger warning here for those of you um, uh, that I'm going to use a uh, uh, use uh, in a quote a racial epithet. So if that's going to upset you, you might want to you might want to mute it for a second. In the Midlands constituency of Smethwick, one Tory candidate. Peter Griffiths, slugged his way to victory on an anti-immigration ticket, buoyed by the slogan, here it is, if you want a nigger for a neighbour, vote Labour. When asked to disown that sentiment, Griffiths replied, I would not condemn anyone who said that. I regard it as a manifestation of popular feeling. Labour won nationally with a 3.5% swing, but it lost in Smethwick with a 17 0.2% swing against it. And later in his diaries, the Labour Minister Richard Crossman concluded that since Smethwick, and I quote, it has been quite clear for Labour that immigration can be the greatest potential vote loser for the party. And so it has been that for the last 60 years, the British political class has refused to engage intelligently with the issue of immigration whether it's Margaret Thatcher sympathising with those who feel swamped by people of a different culture, Michael Howard's Are You Thinking What We're Thinking, Tony Blair's Bulldog, Ed Miliband's Mug, Pretty Patel's Flights, or Swella Braverman's Small Boats, anti-immigration rhetoric is as central to our political and electoral culture as immigration is to our economy. But come election time, the logic goes that fear of a certain kind of immigrant is how you win votes while challenging the basis of that fear, let alone extolling the benefits that most immigrants bring, is how you lose them. And since no party, main party, wants to pay the electoral price for engaging with the issue honestly, the country has little understanding of what immigration is for, what drives it, or who benefits from it, and why. Now, the example I've just given from 60 years ago suggests that the thing I'm going to talk about tonight is not a new problem. But for reasons that I'll go on to explain, I think it's a problem that is becoming particularly acute. Our electoral culture is increasingly proving itself incapable of engaging with the needs of the country. At times, it panders what it perceives to be the popular mood. At others, it resists popular demands in the name of discipline and realpolitik. The one thing it does all too rarely is address the actual issues themselves or seek meaningful solutions to actual problems. Elections are always an important and imperfect inflection point in a political process. Where organized parties rooted, if we're lucky, in ideology and social class, and if we're not rooted in ethnicity, religion, and identity, set out their stall before a somewhat cynical public and an utterly brazen media, employing a form of marketing, masquerading sometimes as morality. At a time when fascism is once again a mainstream ideology and authoritarianism stalks the United States, defending democracy's norms and endorsing its outcomes are crucial. My issue here is not that voters want something that I do not. Uh, there has been, I think, a heavy-handed and high-minded contempt at times for democratic outcomes emerging emerging from people who are otherwise liberal, 
particularly after the Brexit referendum and within the Labour Party after Jeremy Corbyn won the leadership. At times, it was decided that electorates deserved the paternalistic protection to prevent them from self-harm, which meant electoral outcomes could be ignored on the grounds that either people didn't really know what they want or simply that they wanted the wrong thing. I think we cannot simply support democracy when democracy supports us. Or before we know it, we'll find ourselves all too prone to Bertolt Brecht's question after the East Germany's 1953 uprising, would it not be easier to dissolve the people and elect another? My point in this lecture is to illustrate the way in which our democracy is imperiled by, our elect by an electoral system that fails to represent us adequately or address our needs um, and thereby produces distorted outcomes and encourages cynicism and indifference at a time when we need debate and engagement. That we have a system and a culture that favors charlatanism, reductive performance and hollow rhetorical herding over engagement and substance. And that in this election year, we will see these attributes amplified and that it will cost us dearly. Finally, I want to show the way in which our media is complicit in these distortions and our electoral system compounds and entrenches them. I've called it political realism because it is in the name of realism that an awful lot of these distortions and dislocations come about. The suggestion being that this is what you have to do or say to get elected. The unspoken pretext being that if you don't get elected, then you can't actually do anything. And so it's better to say things, even if they don't relate to reality, than say something that does relate to reality and lose. The trouble is that all too often, this electoral realism not only doesn't relate to any kind of reality beyond that constructed by the electoral system and the political and media classes that sustain it, but it actually contradicts it. As the late Irish political scientist Peter Mayer put in Ruling the Void, his 2013 autopsy of the hollowing of Western democracy, the parties have become so disconnected from the wider society and pursue a form of competition that is so lacking in meaning that they no longer seem capable of sustaining democracy in its present form. I want to start with the email I received inviting me to deliver this lecture. It arrived on July the 25th. And this issue was foremost in my mind at that time because it was five days after three important by elections in England. In Somerton and Frome, the Liberal Democrats overturned a Tory majority of more than 19,000 with a 29% swing. In the North Yorkshire seat of Selby and Ainsty, Labour enjoyed a 21% swing, taking a Tory seat that had a 20,000. Uh, 137 majority. And finally, there was Uxbridge and Ryslip, Boris Johnson's former seat in suburban London, where Conservatives clung on despite a 7% swing to Labour, which slashed the Tory majority from 7,210 to 495. It's useful to reflect just for a moment on how these seats became vacant. Nigel Adams stepped down from Selby and Ainsty, piqued that he had been removed from Boris Johnson's resignation honours list and would not be receiving a peerage for the Lords. David Warburton resigned from Somerset and from Somerton and from after he was found to have breached the MP's code of conduct following three allegations of sexual harassment and an admission that he'd taken cocaine. He hadn't had a surgery for, for the best part of a year, but was planning to run again anyway. And then there was Boris Johnson, who resigned after an investigation into his statements around lockdown parties, found that he had lied to the Commons and ordered a 20-day suspension, which could have triggered a recall anyway. When we reflect on electoral cynicism, we could do worse and start with an appreciation of the impact that a culture of decadent entitlement in our political class might have, particularly during a time of economic hardship. The dominant media narrative from these results was that the Conservatives were clearly in serious trouble, presaging a broader electoral calamity down the line, but their victory in Uxbridge suggested a possible route to survival, even if it did cost us the earth. 
They won in Uxbridge. It was decreed, decreed because Labour mo- lost the motorists. Labour leader Keir Starmer was paying the price, it was said, for Labour's London's Labour Mayor, Sadiq Khan, extending the ultra-low emission zone, ULEZ, which would soon force drivers with older, more polluting cars to pay £12.50 a day for their cars. Now, there are arguably other reasons why Labour narrowly failed to win this election, from a flawed candidate selection process to the fact that the seat was totemic for Tories in a way that the others were not. But the media settled on this actually being a defeat for Labour and the source of that defeat being ULES. They couldn't stop talking about it. A Guardian survey found that during the first six months of the year, ULES was mentioned a total of 405 times in the national press in six months. In the 11 days after the result, ULES was made 332 appearances. The political class concurred, and so what started as an opinion began to look like a fact. Now, while it may be debatable whether Ulez was a key factor or the only factor, nobody seriously questions that it was a factor. But the fact that it was an issue doesn't really determine the kind of issue it became. This could have been a conversation which centred on the perils of regressive flat taxes. ULES forces the poor and the rich to pay the same amount imposed at a time of extreme hardship. It could have been a conversation about government support for the transitions to net zero that are needed. But that was not how it was framed. Instead, it was understood as a conflict between environmental protection and economic hardship. It was as though saving the planet was a luxury we simply couldn't afford right now, but maybe in the future. The argument that we shouldn't burden the poor with a fight against climate change, something the Global South has been saying for decades, became we should slow down the fight altogether. The battle lines were not just economic or environmental, but cultural too. Into the already crowded pantheon of identity politics came a new protected category, the driver. Within 24 hours of the election result, Keir Starmer decided that Labour lost because of ULES too, and was urging Khan to rethink the tax, while Angela Rayner castigated her mayoral colleague for not listening to voters. The next day, Starmer insisted, we are doing something very wrong if policies put forward by the Labour Party end up on each and every Tory leaflet. We've got to face up to that and learn the lessons. In fact, the first opinion poll taken after the introduction of ULES showed that more Londoners supported it than opposed it. 47% in favour and 42% against. Fairly evenly divided, it is true, with significant opposition, but certainly not in the category of wildly unpopular. But never mind, the tide had turned. With the opposition refusing to make the case that an element of shared sacrifice was necessary to protect the environment, an argument they could have made while not giving ULES their full endorsement, the road was clear for the Conservatives to backtrack on environmental commitments without much fear of electoral retribution. Within a couple of months, Rishi Sunak had decided to defy the recommendations of the Climate Change Committee and push back the ban on purchasing new petrol cars from 2030 to 2035 and delay the target of eliminating gas boilers. Proving that this intervention owed more to culture in many ways than to carbon or even cash, Sunak then went on to insist that he would scrap various proposals for encouraging behaviour change. He said the government would no longer interfere in how many passengers you can have in your car, even though the government had never interfered in how many passengers you can have in your car. He said the government would no longer force you to have seven different bins in your home, even though the government had never forced anyone to have seven different bins in their home. And it wouldn't make you change your diet and harm British farmers by taxing meat, even though no proposals to tax meat existed. In other words, he would stop proposing things that no one was proposing and stop doing things that nobody was doing. Now I could go on, but the point isn't really specifically about Euler's at all. It's about the consensus that quickly emerged between the two main parties around what was electorally realistic in this case, with regard to the environment. Ideologies 
argued the late Stuart Hall, work more effectively when we are not aware that how we formulate and construct a statement about the world is underpinned by ideological premises, when our formulations seem to be simply descriptive statements about how things are, i.e. must be, or what we can, quote, take for granted. The trouble is, this conversation about ULES was not taking place in a vacuum. Sometimes literally on the next page or the next item on the news and effectively on a split screen, another related priority was making itself felt. The week of the Uxbridge by-election saw world temperature records broken twice. Firefighters, meanwhile, battled blazes in the southern Italian region of Calabria and properties in Sicily suffered blackouts as temperatures surged as the island's Palermo airport was closed after being encircled by wildfire. Thousands of tourists and residents fleeing wildfires on the Greek island of Rose. Um, there were 10,000 British tourists on the island, forced, uh, many of whom were forced to seek shelter in schools, sports centres and airports. Fires also spread through Portugal and Croatia, while sea temperatures rose to the high 20s around Spain, Greece, Turkey and Italy, making it unsafe to enter the water. The environment was no longer a significant, a, a signifier distant in time and space. We were no longer talking about the next 20 or 30 years of droughts in remote lands. As if the tales of children in the city suffering from asthma and poor air quality weren't enough, these were contemporaneous climate catastrophes at familiar holiday destinations. Here was a reality that spoke to the urgency of tackling the sources of climate change and a suggestion that the price for not doing so might be higher than £12.50 a day. As George Orwell wrote in 1984, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. But in this case, it's not a party, but parties, offering a sense of pluralism and choice. I'm not, of course, claiming that uh, only ULES could stop Southern Europe burning, but that the electoral reality that ostensibly forced the main parties to distance themselves from ULES in no way collided with the environmental reality that was raging elsewhere at the same time on the continent. The two stories took place as though in alternate universes. To be realistic in the electoral arena, it was necessary to ignore the reality ranging beyond it. The cost of protecting the environment was understood to be £12.50 a day. It could apparently not be calculated even in terms of disruptive ho disrupted holidays, let alone forests destroyed, air pollution and lives lost. Meanwhile, 60 years after my mother arrived, the cognitive dissonance around immigration continues. The government has made immigration a centerpiece of its platform. Its flagship proposals are to send asylum seekers to Rwanda and to stop small boats with people who do not have documents coming across the English Channel. It claims most asylum seekers or many asylum seekers are not legitimate refugees, but instead economic migrants who are jumping the queue, seeking work and a better life. And this has put pressure on a system it says, that is costly and not fit for purpose. Immigration, they insist, drives down wages and puts pressure on public services. And all of this has come with some quite incendiary rhetoric. Uh, uh, the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has described a hurricane of mis mass immigration with millions trying to enter the country and an invasion on our southern coast. Even Kemi Badenoch said that was too much. Labour's response, meanwhile, has not been moral, but managerial. The Rwanda plan is unworkable. They would manage the system better, clearing backlogs, stopping hotel use, and so on. But the consensus between them has been allowed to stand that asylum is a proxy for immigration, and that immigration is a problem. Now, the first thing that should be noted here is the numbers. 1.2 million people came to Britain in the year to June 2022. 76,000 people requested, or there or thereabouts, requested asylum for the year ending in September 2023. 45% of those came in small boats. 
So asylum seekers comprise 7.5% of all immigrants, and those coming in small boats specifically comprise about 3.5% of all immigrants. So if the government stopped all the small boats and flew all of the asylum seekers out of the country, it would merely barely make a dent in our immigration figures. And this we actually found out uh, in more detail last week as we saw that net immigration is going up. 745,000 more people came to Britain than left last year. So whatever the government is doing, and let's not forget that in the years that it has done many things, it has done, uh, uh, it has been involved in the Windrush scandal, among other things, whatever it's been doing, it's not working. So even if the government were to prevent, um, yes, so now the government plans to deport legitimate asylum seekers to Rwanda is, like you, Les, also divisive. It has significant opposition with 40% opposed and slightly more supporting uh, uh, supporting it than backing it, around 44%. After the court ruling, a plurality believed, the court ruling saying that Rwanda was not a safe place to send people uh, or a secure place, a plurality now believed that we should scrap the plan entirely. When it comes to small boats, the emphasis on the fact that the people are breaking the law and coming into the country without being vetted in any way. But the truth is there is no safe way to apply for asylum from outside of the UK. And there is no visa which allows people to claim asylum once you're here. So in the absence of safe routes, you have to break some kind of law to get here. Between March 2018 and 2023, two thirds of the people arriving on small boats, either from places were from either places where there's military conflict and social collapse, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Sudan, or political repression, Iran and Eritrea. A third of them, it's worth noting, are from countries that we have been involved in bombing. So the reality is at odds with the rhetoric, and the rhetoric drives a perception that in turn drives the politics. I'm not in denial about immigration being an issue the strength of feeling that some have about it, or the various iterations that those feelings can take. I understand that. Indeed, it's once again the number one issue for conservatives. And I don't think it's in my or anybody else's uh, interest to duck that issue. Indeed, my point here is that I wish we would talk about the issue more intelligently. But this electoral reality is also at odds with other realities. First of all, immigration is not quite the issue most people think it is. In Britain, we think there are twice as many migrants and four times as many Muslims, and Muslims are often, the issue of Muslims is often um, uh, wrapped up in the issue of immigration in terms of uh, 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 culture and um, uh, assimilation that British people believe there's twice as many migrants and four times as many Muslims in the country than there actually are. So we don't have a proportionate understanding of the problem. Secondly, a third of immigrants are foreign students whose exorbitant fees are an essential part of the model for our university system, which is chronically underfunded. But mostly, this discussion is taking place during an acute labor shortage. We actually need immigrants. There are approximately one million vacancies in our labour market that we can't fill. We can argue about whether British workers should be filling those vacancies, but the fact is they aren't. One of the places where those vacancies are most acute is care homes. About 390,000 care workers leave their roles every year, with around a third leaving the sector altogether. There are currently 152,000 care staff vacancies. The shortage in care home workers in turn means that patients cannot be moved from hospitals into care. And this is one of the reasons why waiting lists keep growing. And who is given the challenge of clearing those waiting lists? Well, 20% of NHS staff are immigrants. 25% of NHS staff are immigrants and their descendants. 42% of the NHS medical staff are immigrants and their descendants. So the net effect of immigration on the NHS isn't to put a stress on it, but to relieve the strain on it. Once again, a consensus has emerged in the name of electoral reality that constructed a consensus around immigration that sits in direct contradiction to the actual reality. 
So why does all this matter? Because as we approach an election year, we have an election culture that is proving increasingly incapable of metabolizing our actual needs. And those needs are many. Our public services are on our knees. Inflation is significantly higher than most of Europe and almost double that of the United States. Interest rates are at a 15 year high. House prices are trending down. R rents are rocketing. A slump in retail sales suggests an impending recession. A fifth of the country live at risk of poverty, resulting in tw a 25% increase in new loans from pawnbrokers in the last year. Our public servants are voting with their feet and leaving for better pay elsewhere. Um, we are about to spill industrial quantities of ink and create hours of television around an electoral spectacle purporting to be about us, the issues that we are interested in, and the options for tackling them. But sadly, it will produce nothing of the kind. Um, uh, and I'm minded here of um, the words of the late Stuart Hall, uh, who was asked in 2000, uh, uh, 2008, how he felt about the political, the state of um, uh, the British political scene shortly before the financial crisis. And he said, I feel the world as a stranger to me, a stranger to me than I ever felt before. Should we have a political party that believes we should tune ourselves up to the global economy? Of course we should, but not two or two and a half. It's when everybody is operating in so many of the same parameters that the only debate you can have is a sort of Swiftian debate. Shall we eat the children now or later? Nor are these the parameters within which the British nor are the parameters within which the British political class are operating in order to win this election broadly speaking, aligned with the electorate itself. Polls show a significant majority for nationalizing energy companies and water, which both parties oppose. A majority for a ceasefire in Gaza, which both parties oppose. The proportion of Britons who believe the government should control prices and reduce income inequality has more than doubled since 2006, and now stands at more than half the country, according to a recent report by the British Social Attitude Survey, which concluded, among other things, the public are as left-wing in their outlook as they have been at any time since 1986. The election will reflect none of this. There are several plausible explanations for this disconnect, but for the purposes of this lecture, I want to focus on just two, our electoral system and the press, uh, or the media. The dominant trends in electoral politics over the last few decades that seem likely to play out this time are twofold, a decline in turnout and a fracturing of allegiances. Between 1945 and 1997, turnout in British elections never went below 70%. Since 2001, it has never reached 70%. In 1950, it reached as high as 84%. In 2001, it went as low as 59%. Meanwhile, the two main parties no longer command the loyalties they once did. In 1951, 97% of votes went to either Conservative or Labour. At the last election, it was 76%. In the four elections of the 50s, the two parties netted on average 94% of all of the votes, uh, of the votes between them, the votes cast. In the four elections of the last decade, it was just 73%. One of the rarely acknowledged facts of Tony Blair's record is that while he did win three elections, by the third one, Labour netted only 70% of the votes it received in the first. The trouble is a first-past-the-post electoral system is designed to ensure that one of those parties will end up forming the government. Indeed, one of the central claims going for first-past-the-post is that it produces strong one-party government. It was always debatable. It was always debatable whether that was desirable, it's no longer debatable whether that's true. It's clearly not. Proportional representation would not just faithfully reflect the actual wishes of the country. It would offer more choice of alternatives, uncoupling a necessity to fish only in the middle, leaving the margins open to a range of hucksters and carnival barkers who can appeal to a portion of the electorate 
who feel nobody is talking to them. So what we have is fewer people voting and less of them backing either of the parties that will ultimately lead to lead the country, producing governments with diminishing legitimacy in an electoral culture with less consensus and more cynicism. In 2019, the Conservatives achieved their landslide with just 29% of the eligible vote. In 1950, the Tories lost, despite receiving the support of 38% of the eligible vote. In the words of Peter Mayer, it has now become more than evident that citizens are withdrawing and disengaging from the arena of conventional politics. Even when they vote, and this is less often than before, or in smaller proportions, their preferences emerge closer and closer to the moment of voting itself, and are now less easily guided by cohesive partisan cues. For whatever reason, and there is no shortage of hypotheses offering to explain this change, there are now fewer and fewer stand patterns, and hence more and more citizens who, when they think about politics at all, are likely to operate on the basis of short-term considerations and influences. Electorates, in this sense, are becoming progressively destructured, affording more escape to the media to play the role of agenda setter and requiring a much greater campaign effort from both parties and candidates. Which brings me to my second point, the media. Because this sense of dislocation is in no small part a product of a broader political distortion that is paid out especially aggressively during an election campaign. Now, in Britain, we notionally have freedom of the press, although, as early 20th century journalist A.J. Liebling once pointed out, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. We need not be in denial about the party political bias of that press. During the last four general elections from 2010 to 2019, mainstream British national newspapers made 31 endorsements. The Tories received 22, Labour 7, um, uh, 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 and Labour 7. Uh, in other words, um, the Tories received uh, more than 70% of all endorsements. This has become such an established and accepted feature of our media culture that even its beneficiaries have ceased to recognise it as a benefit in kind. In his book, All Out War, Sunday Times correspondent Tim Shipman described the shock that Tory Remainers had when they experienced a hostile press. The Tories in the Remain camp were about to run a referendum campaign, he writes, based on a playbook for winning elections in an environment where the print media was sympathetic. Um, uh, this is me now, senior Tories were not used to having their arguments distorted, the facts so hideously disfigured in their opponents' favour that they were unrecognisable or blatant falsehoods by the opposition taken seriously. These were not only the rules of engagement in which they were unaccustomed, they were the rules under which they could not compete. It pains me to say it, a member of Cameron's team told Shipman, but if the Mail, Sun and the Telegraph had been for in, we would have romped home. But the issue with the press isn't just one of party bias, but of social stratification. For our opinion formers in the media class reflect the same oligarchic biases that exist elsewhere, only worse. Those who went to private school in Britain comprise 7% of the country's population, um, uh, but 39% of the elite. Those who went to Oxford or Cambridge University comprise less than 1% of the population, but 24% of the elite. This is uh, according to the uh, uh, report by the Sutton Trust. But the media is particularly bad. Their report from just four years ago found that more columnists came from elite backgrounds than senior judges and lords. This gene puddle from which the elite siphons its ranks has become shallow and fetid. Those who make the laws in government or oversee the civil service that will implement them, adjudicate on them in court, or assess them in newspapers, are drawn from such a notional, narrow social layer, particularly where the press and politics is concerned, that they might as well be the same person. If we look at the career trajectories of Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, George Osborne, William Rees Mogg, and others, then uh, uh, they are often literally the same person. Now, this isn't a party political point. One could slide Seamus Milne, for example, in there too. But given the class nature of the Tory hierarchy and the bias in the British press, you'll never even the score. 
These are the people who decide whom or what is electable, not the electorate. Those decisions are made before anyone goes to the polls. These are the people with no experience of what it's like to live on universal credit, to need free school dinners for their kids during the holidays, or find themselves at the mercy of a rural bus system that's falling apart, who frame the contours for what is and isn't realistic when it comes to electability. In his landmark book, Public Opinion, Walter Lippmann wrote, the only feeling that anyone can have about an event he doesn't experience is the feeling aroused by his mental image of that event. This is why until we know what others think they know, we can't truly understand their acts. Our opinions cover a bigger space, a longer reach of time, a greater number of things than we can directly as observe. They have, therefore, to be pieced together out of what others have reported. But when what others report is tainted by bias and distortion, the pieces often don't fit together and people struggle to make sense of the picture. This should not be taken as an infantilization of the electorate. They are, of course, capable of making up their own minds, but they can only do so from the information that's available. And it's simply not possible to make an informed decision when is one, one is routinely, willfully and cynically misinformed. It's not possible to hold our political class to account when they feel that they are behave, able to behave with impunity in no small part because they are not subject to sufficient scrutiny. We need conversation and debate about what will change and how, not just who will win and why. The electoral realism presented to us as fact represents the ideological, moral and strategic boundaries of a risk averse culture designed to sustain the political class, not us. An election year should see, should see political debate align more closely with political reality. But sadly, we are once again seeing things go in the other direction. We are about to embark, in conclusion, on a year's worth of polling, focus groups, manifestos, agendas, town halls, vox pop, special graphics, demographics, maps, target seats, target voters, swingometers, marginals, slogans, posters and commentary. It would be wonderful if all that energy was deployed in pursuit of a discussion that is substantial and relevant. Since the last election, we've experienced a pandemic, massive anti-racist protests, rampant inflation, a wave of strikes, two huge wars in which we are implicated, the collapse of our health and transport systems, and three prime ministers, but to name a few things. It's not as though we don't have a lot to talk about. We just have yet to find a way to talk about them meaningfully. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. That was an uh, incredibly powerful narrative and supported so well with evidence uh, drawing across such a wide range of sources and social science sources too. Um, brilliant. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Jane just after a quick reminder to the audience that um, do get your questions into the Q&A box and do upvote any that you uh, particularly like. Um, Jane, over to you. Thank you very much, Bobby. And um... I want to kind of give us a moment because if we were all in person, we would be applauding Gary now <laughs> and we're not in person. So we're just going to segue straight to some comments from me, but we would be applauding Gary. And, and I want to just really, just before I begin, just say how grateful I am to have this opportunity to, to follow that and also to talk to you all. And I want to um, just take a moment and make an assumption that all of us care deeply and passionately about our political system. We care deeply and passionately about the country that we're living in and the world we're living in. And, um, and I imagine that's true for all of us who are joining today. And so, you know, we're very grateful to Gary for his comments, for provoking us and to making us think this through. And so what I want to do in response is ask two questions. The first question I want to pose to all of us, um, and so I can't ask you to respond, um, but I can invite you to think about your response to it. Um, so the first question is simply, what should 
our response to all of this be as people that are social scientists or who are around and adjacent to the social sciences or who have you know a stake in a different way and the second question i want to to raise um, from my own perspective is what does this mean what does gary's analysis mean for the next general election so what do i think is going to be the outcome of the analysis that Gary has given us. Um, in thinking about the first question, what should our response be to it all? I want to give some kind of preliminary tentative answers of my own. And, um, and I have three um, in, in three little buckets. The first one, I think, and, and it's it might be true that we might feel like we're talking or screaming into the void. Um, but we have to continue to pursue facts, to pursue accurate interpretations of what public concerns are. And indeed, the penalties to political parties, certainly for my own work as a political scientist and as somebody who focuses on elections, of ignoring public concerns and the state of people's lives. I'm, I'm happy uh, that when you know, Gary gave us the example of ULES, of the ultra low emission zone and the Uxbridge, and bio, um, Uxbridge by-election, I'm, I'm at least happy that I was saying at the time when I was saying on live television, this is not the reason and this is not the correct interpretation for that by-election. Now, admittedly, somebody like myself isn't going to overturn the narrative and isn't going to be um, able to do that. But we have to be there to say that. And um, and I think it's a really a call to arms that we have to be pursuing the truth and an accurate interpretation as much as we possibly can. I think the second part of the response for me thinking about this is we also have to speak out if you have a platform, and I imagine that many people listening indeed do have their own platform of a kind. In fact, social media has given us all a platform of some size or shape or form. Um, we have to we have to give voice to people's concerns. Um, one of the things in my own work that we've tried to do is to I like to describe what I have been trying to do over recent years as revealing hidden electorates. You know, there are parts of the electorate that essentially are misunderstood, not seen, not don't have a voice, who haven't been analyzed sufficiently or understood efficient, uh, sufficiently. And what that means is that people, politicians, political parties can focus in on what they think is really driving their electoral appeal and taking some of the wrong lessons. So we are able to show, for example, that around some a figure around 17 million people in the UK are over 40 and are genuinely very concerned about their younger family members and have policy preferences that are in favour of more housing and more spending on younger generations. And that indeed we're not in such a polarised or as self-interested style of politics that might otherwise have assumed all you have to do if you want to keep the votes of older voters is to keep on giving older voters what they want. Well, in actual fact, we live in families, we live in very, very close networks, and we have very strong concerns for other people to whom we're closely in contact with and related to. So we're able to, to show those hidden electorates. And I think, you know, again, we might feel that we're not doing enough, but at least we can do that, at least we can give voice to other people's concerns. I think the third part of my response is one where I reflect on changes that have taken place since I started doing research, which was 20 years ago now. And when I started doing research 20 years ago, it was absolutely the case that very difficult questions were being asked of politicians and political parties. And there'd been the scandals in the 1990s under John Major's government, cash for questions and sleaze, and all of that. And of course that had had an impact on public trust and it had an impact on trust in politicians. But in the 20 years that I've been doing research, I've seen a very significant, a very significant shift in our trust in politicians, our trust in political institutions and the credibility with which they're held. And I, and I really, what I really find is that, you know, what I really fear, I think, 
is that if we're not careful, we risk being part of the problem. Um, so if we say, you know, there's a very, 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 very strong opinion now that all politicians are the same, all political parties are the same. This is one of the hugely significant aspects of the next election that can Labour differentiate themselves sufficiently to give people a sense of hope and a sense of a different purpose and a different sense of answers to the big problems that we face. But that sense that all politicians are just as bad as each other risks undermining some of the excellence in politics, some of the people who are public servants, the people that are working day in, day out really hard. And I just feel like we have to find ways to uphold excellence as well as as well as call for higher standards. Because otherwise, once all politicians are bad and the public have decided that all politicians are bad, then what in, you know, who do we get as our politicians? What incentives are there for going into politics? And of course, you know, we've seen two of our MPs be murdered in recent years. And, you know, this kind of whole narrative that, you know, politicians are corrupt and, and, and need to, you know, somehow be attacked is causing huge abuse uh, um, to, towards politicians. And it's called, uh, causing particularly high levels of abuse towards women and minorities. And so we have to find a way of talking about this, of saying like, here are the good examples, here are the people we want to, to do better. I think that's true too when we talk about our media and we talk about journalism. Um, Gary talked about the utterly brazen nature of our media, and I don't disagree with that at all, but I also think there are utterly brilliant examples in our media, and I'm sure Gary agrees with that as well, himself coming from a journalism background and also writing still, but, but we also have to do our best to uphold and lift up investigative journalism and public service journalism, because if we don't do that, and if we live in a world where we say, well, the media are part of the problem, we, we just generalize too much. We throw the baby out with the bathwater. And the consequence of that is that we don't see enough investment and enough funding for the best investigative and the best public service journalism that we so badly need to hold our politicians to account. And of course, that's true in our institutions as well. Our political institutions are, of course, flawed. You know, they're, they're of course, not perfect. It's a given, isn't it? The institutions aren't perfect and the human beings aren't either. But we have to find ways to, I think, talk up what we're proud of as well as as well as call um, other examples to account. So those are just a few a few initial thoughts of my own, but I think it's really incumbent on all of us to think about how we can be at least a very small part of some of the response to, to, the, to the real challenges that Gary poses. Um, my next question was, what does this all mean for the upcoming general election? And here I just want to say three things, and this builds on my research using British election study data and research that we've been doing here at Nuffield College. Um, we're working on a book on the uh, British election study using British election study data that follows the last election. And we're also tracking, we're tracking um, voters since 2019. And we've been following very closely what has mattered since 2019 and how has the electorate responded to what they've seen post, um, post Brexit and post um, the 2019 general election. So the first, um, the first lesson that I've taken from my analysis of this period has been that the voters really are rejecting parties that don't address their concerns. And I think, you know, one of the things, if we might take some heart, is that those mechanisms of accountability really exist. And I think it's even true. So we have voters for whom the government is not talking about their primary concerns on cost of living and the economy. We also have voters that the government is talking to, and Gary mentioned there that Conservative voters do care the most about immigration, and that's absolutely true. But even those Conservative, 2019 Conservative voters, and I learned this from a talk that John Curtis was giving last week, and he was showing that even evaluations in, on immigration amongst those Conservative 2019 voters aren't related to people changing in their party support. So even by talking about immigration, by focusing on immigration, that's actually not shifting those voters. And the reason is, is that what we've seen 
since 2019 is four very significant competent shocks. We first had COVID. We saw voters move away from the Conservatives after that period, especially those voters who had gone to the Conservatives most recently. They were the softer Conservatives or the softer voters. They moved first. Then we saw, of course, Partygate and um, lockdown breaches. Then we had the period of Liz Truss as Prime Minister and, and that all the, all the difficulties around that on the economy. And then, of course, we've had the cost of living crisis. And what's happened is that those four competence shocks have essentially been orthogonal to all of the other Brexit divides, the ideological debates. Those have been the things that have mattered. They are fundamentally about reputation, about trust, about credibility. And those are the factors that have shifted the electorate away from the Conservative Party in public opinion terms at the current time. So we wait to see whether or not that sticks. I should imagine it will stick to a huge degree, even though there may be some narrowing. But the interesting thing here and the interesting implication about politics being these questions of credibility and trust and people just saying, hang on a minute, this is just not OK. I'm just not happy with this, is that these resets aren't resetting anything. And by talking about immigration and focusing on those issues that voters don't predominantly care about, it isn't doing anything for the government's reputation. So that's that's one kind of implication for the political process, for political parties to take away from this, is that actually there is a penalty to ignoring people's concerns. The second point I think we learn, and, um, and Gary mentioned this concept of governing with impunity, and it has really concerned me um, since 2019 that there has been in many, many instances, you know, black being called white and white being called black and all sorts of things being said. And almost, you know, and I passionately um, believe in the fundamental, the fundamentals of the electorate having good sense and um, working things out. And, and there, were, there was a period where I thought, it does look like there isn't any, any accountability here. It does look like voters aren't moving away from the government when COVID in particular was being handled incredibly badly. And of course, there were many interesting reasons for that around, um, around people's expectations and the trust and that they wanted to place in the government and also the understanding that this was incredibly hard period of time. But that didn't last. And voters have, or you know, individuals in the electorate, whether they be voters or not voters, have indeed moved away from the government. And I think, you know, they haven't got away with it so far. They might get away with it with um people who are very loyal. And this isn't just an attack on the government. I'm not attacking the government. I'm just, I would say this for any political party in power, um, saying anything in a similar way. And then the last thing I wanted to reflect on was just the last two general elections. Um, because in these two general elections, the votes for the two largest parties increased very substantially. So in 2017, we saw that shoot up. Um, so the two largest parties got around 85, 87% of the vote between them. And it was also true that turnout increased. So in 2017, we got up to around 69% in terms of turnout. In 2019, it fell back again to 27%. So the question is, you know, what do we take from that? Is that a period where the decline of support for the two major parties has somehow been reversed? Is this some challenge um, to Gary's analysis? And I, no, I don't think it is. I think it's highly anomalous. And it's for lots and lots of complicated reasons, which I won't go into, and, and not so complicated reasons as well, to be, to be fair. But I think what it taught us is that when the two major parties did confront the primary issue that had become the most salient, the most significant issue to the public, but also to politics over that period of time. But essentially what they did, the two largest parties started to compete on the dimension, on the different sort of what we call the second dimension in politics, the cultural dimension, the nationalism dimension, the one that's related to immigration concerns and Brexit preferences. Those two major parties they really did start competing and confronting that very significant and salient dimension. And they did, in relative terms at least, represent those two major sides of the debate. Now, we can argue about how well they did that and everything else, but in relative terms, they confronted that issue, they shifted onto that dimension, and they gave voters a choice. 
And so it shows us what can happen, at least, if the two mainstream parties do in front, indeed confront the issues of greatest concern at the present time. Now, the problem is now is that I think the political process is, you know, the political um, parties and actors are somewhat thinking back to that 2019 election and trying to refight it. And they're trying to refight that election to shore up that Leave coalition for the Conservatives in particular, but without Boris Johnson, without Jeremy Corbyn, without a two year stalemate and without Brexit being the most significant issue to voters, voters have moved on onto the cost of living crisis and onto the economy. So that's not going to work for them. And that's going to be one of the conclusions, I think, that we draw from the uh, outcome of the next election, in all likelihood, at least. So let me conclude um, just by emphasising um, that I think, you know, we can all be part of addressing and understanding what are the real concerns. We can speak up for them. We can uphold the very best in politics and journalism and in our political institutions. And, and voters do ultimately hold parties to account for the kinds of the kinds of very very problematic and 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 hugely difficult um, context that Gary has outlined so succinct so so eloquently but also succinctly for us. And I think we're likely to see Gary's analysis be an important part of our understanding of the outcome of the next election. So that's all from me. And um, I'm sure I, I will look forward to your questions and, and as will Gary. Thank you. That's brilliant. That was excellent. Thank you so much, James. That's such a brilliant addition to um, context for, for Gary's points. So I'm just going to come to Gary to see if there's anything that you'd like to immediately react to from Jane's points before we go to questions. Um, uh, just uh, to agree with she's J Jane is right when she's when she says um, I think there is there is a danger of encouraging even deeper cynicism if um, one assumes a very broad brush all politics all politicians are corrupt none of them are listening um, uh, all journalists are uh, in bed with the political class, none of them are doing their job. Uh, and of course she's right that there are there are people doing there are people doing good things. My fear is that they are not winning in their class, that they are not the dominant force in their class. But of course uh, the lockdown parties that was we know about that because of journalism and because the you know because of a pursuit in journalism that we wouldn't so not everybody's in the bag and not everybody is part of that elite but it's also true that in some ways I think that the kind of lockdown parties egregious as they were weren't the worst thing that they did during the pandemic and what we're seeing in the kind of um um uh in the kind of um tribunal that's taking place now all these kind of execrable things that were taking place and similarly there are journalists on both sides of the aisle who are dedicated to their um uh, uh dedicated to their constituents who are trying to do uh, the, the best job they can i guess i fear that in both in in both cases I you know I applaud them, but they're not that they are. They are not the dominant. They are not the dominant force. At times, it feels like they are a dying breed. But the but the the note of caution in uh, uh, in what Jane says is actually very important. That our democracies are very fragile, and we can see that at the moment. And if you um, if you paint with too broad a brush, if you um uh if you're not sufficiently careful about how these things are portrayed and one might argue that in order to make a point i wasn't um that um you could actually lose some quite important points in that argument they're all the same they're all corrupt you can't trust what the journalists say that is actually kind of a significant part of the Trump agenda of uh, uh, climate change deniers and a, a range of other things. So we do have to be careful. We do have to be careful about how we frame this. Great, thank you. 
very um really difficult balance to get right um particularly with the public who've got lots going on in their lives and limited attention spans for, for this type of discussion so i've, I've got we got brilliant questions thank you to the audience i'm uh i'm gonna I'm going to do a mammoth kind of theming for the next one, but I did want to, and the, I do want to take the upvoting seriously because it is really useful to see what people are interested in your thoughts on. And the first one, uh, while lots of them are about the themes of how do we make this better, um, this this the, the actually the most popular question is actually a very specific one, and from Dr. Martha Banks, who who says, as I listened from the United States. I'm struck by the parallels between the British political rhetoric and the US political rhetoric, uh, rhetoric both based on racism. Um, is it your impression that the US is learning from the UK or is the UK learning from the US? And we, we couldn't have a, a a more expert person to ask that to than you, Gary. So I, I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts. Um, in my experience, uh, America cares very little about what's going on in Britain. You know, <laughs> the special relationship is special for us, not for them. Uh, but that the issues of um, uh, of race and difference actually play out quite differently in uh, those two countries. There is there 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 are some uh, overlaps, um, but I, I I think I think they are. Um, I think they're quite different, but I think that what we are seeing in America and in Europe, and to some extent we are seeing it here, is um, a um, uh, some attraction towards kind of forms of authoritarianism, uh, a kind of a, a, a social fracturing in terms of people not uh, not just not uh being uh, arguing but actually arguing with different facts and different realities about kind of actually what uh um uh, about what is going on which is about the uh which is about social media if we look at the elections in um uh in the netherlands um if we look at what happened in ireland immigration is a point of anxiety in a lot of the Western world. And that's as true in America as it is in Britain, but it does play out differently in America where most people can access some immigrant thing in their in their background. So uh, I think they they are different, but I think that there is um, there is a significant amount of overlap. And the, the central point that I think um, is key for both, is a prevailing sense of almost learned helplessness, a sense that, like you know, that the world is is um, um, is challenging and changing, and it's changing in a way that people can't control. That I think is a general is is a general feeling in the West. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Mm. Very much so. So I'm I'm going to try my mammoth running together of some themes to try to get as many people's questions in as as possible. It sort of starts with the framing that you the, the really useful framing about rhetoric and reality mm. that you, you bring to this, Gary, and and that's called to my own work, called to lots of things Jane's done about misperceptions of social reality. And I think it's like it is absolutely true that not talking about those issues is not the answer. But it's also arguably true that trying to convince people with facts is also seldom the full answer mm. to those types of things because it's so wrapped up with identity and emotional reactions. So a lot of the themes that come out in the questions are really about how do we get that better? How do we make that better? And and I'll just run through a few. There's quite a lot of interest in structural and system changes from people about, so there's a question about, do you feel that proportional representation will help alleviate the influence of the mainstream media? But if we're so easily directed by uh, powerful, powerful few commentators, is there a risk that that won't help? Um, and as regards to declining turnout at election, is there a role for compulsory voting as in Australia? Does that help? And then is de devolution, any um, devolution, any any answer, any relevance or, or answer to this? Um, uh, so the, anything around those kind of um, structural changes, do we think they will help in this? Um, so I think that um, uh, this will this will um, sound like a cop out. Devol devolution would be for the Scots or the Welsh or the Irish. I think that the more 
um, the more Britain as a unit feels dysfunctional, the more, um, I mean, Scotland is actually having a very different conversation about immigration. The, they, um, their um, uh, first minister came out the other day and said, actually, we need immigrants. That would be, you know, that would be a good thing for us. Um, so what we're seeing with devolution are these are these different political cultures and electoral cultures flourishing, not least because uh, they don't all have first past the post. And that's creating a, di a, a, a different kind of space. I don't know, but it seems that the head of steam may have receded for now when it comes to moving from devolution to independence. But I do believe that <clears throat> devolution suggests other options within a kind of uh, within a community of the United Kingdom where people aren't so different. It's one thing saying, well, they do it differently in Sweden. And then people say, well, that's the Swedes. But they do it differently in Scotland. They do it differently in Wales. There was a suggestion, well, why can't we have that? Why can't we do that? So, and just to give a few examples of that, knife crime is one. That that is a place where if you go to Scotland, they deal with knife crime differently and they've dealt with it successfully. And so that's a conversation that we could have, you know, in, in a different way. I've personally never been a great fan of compulsory voting just because I think it's it's um, because I think there is actually sometimes some power in not voting that kind of um, it's for the it's for the electoral class to set out a stall that will attract people not to force people to the stall and say you have to choose one of these even if you don't even if you uh, uh, even if you don't want them. Um, and proportional representation, I think, would help everything. I uh, Everything is too big of a stretch, but I think it would certainly um, allow a more sophisticated intervention for all of us at the ballot box between, do you want this one to win or that one to win? That's it. That really is all it you know i mean it doesn't only come down to that because people may decide well i'm gonna choose morally to do this or that or the other but that uh so long as you have the choice of just two things and so long as those um uh those two things particularly are divorced from the social base that created them which i think they increasingly are i think it, it, it it's um it's 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 deeply it's deeply problematic. I mean, one thing I would say in terms of, because I was aware when I was writing this, you're not uh, you're not giving people an awful lot of hope here, <laughs> um, is that, um, and I felt this after Brexit, uh, I I supported Remain. I thought that um, what we needed was a, a a process of sort of militant civic engagement that we needed to be more involved and more engaged in our communities. And that that doesn't give a meta response to what the problem was, but <clears throat> one of the things I did was started volunteer teaching at the local school, which is where my uh, uh, daughter goes. And that created a different set of conversations with me with, from, with a different set of people who I didn't uh, always see. Now, I can't claim any great political achievement for that but i felt that and feel that there is a lot of uh, uh doom scrolling shouting at the television um having people like you who went to similar sorts of schools have similar sorts of backgrounds or work in a similar environment round to your house so you can all complain about nobody understands you rather than actually just get getting involved you know where your where your life is and um uh but in a way that may inconvenience you um and so i and i i, I still believe that and the one other thing i would say and this is something we've been a bit, i've been trying to set up through code in manchester was a large number of non-white people always complaining about how the media misrepresented them and i said well then let's misrepresent let's well, not misrepresent let's represent ourselves if they're not having the conversations that we want if the conversations are being funneled through what piers morgan said what Meghan markle wore or whatever let's 
actually hold the conversations that we want? Why are we waiting for them to uh, um, um, talk about us in a certain way? Why, why don't we start the conversations that we want? So I think there has to be some sense of ownership and that demands a, that that demands an effort and an engagement. Great stuff, yeah, like really important points about where you can engage, and that can make a real diff huge difference. And um, Jane, I wondered whether you had any thoughts on that as well. I, mean, I was only going to. I was thinking about this from a very different angle, I think, and that's just an observation. Um, my colleague Chris Prosser, uh, working with the British Election Study data over time, we've been trying to understand the the sort of two dual things. One is that, and this is very consistent with your work, Bobby, one is that there are fewer and fewer people over time who hold more sort of traditional views about immigration or more right of centre views of immigration. So we're seeing anti-immigration views and hostility to immigration actually decline as a proportion of the population overall. Um, and it's not just about immigration, it's also about other cultural, cultural issues. And of course, this has happened um, because of generational change. And so, so that's a really interesting context in which we're talking about this, because we're actually talking about debates about race, um, lessons from America and, 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 and everything else, and thinking about what might be the institutional solutions to this in a context where actually on the surface, this should be declining in importance over time because the majority of the public hold more liberal attitudes. Um, but it's also true that these issues are becoming more important um, electorally. And so the relevance of these kinds of different issues has increased at the same time as the proportion of people that hold more antagonistic views has decreased. And so that's really interesting to understand what are the factors that have led to that kind of combination of things. Um, so I think I, I'm not sure that I would look to some of the institutional solutions there, but but more to and perhaps um, proportional representation is a part of this. But it's what are the incentives to capitalize and to politicize and to increase divisions and increase the salience of those issues. And, you know, to what degree do people feel more and more uncomfortable because the majority is moving against their view? And yeah. how do we resolve those kinds of tensions and those kinds of difficulties with honest conversations? Um, so I was really, really thinking about those things. And yeah. I think understanding the root causes of those is is kind of the key here to thinking about what might what might be some of the solutions to to taking some of the pressure out of these particular issues mm. that's a really important point and the almost perfect scripty segue into the final little group of questions i mean it, and just as, as context in this we, we're doing a big program of research on culture wars trying to understand cult culture wars evolution in public opinion in the uk and we, we've done a lot of looking at the us lessons for that because it's so clear that distrust and division are so intertwined um, those distrust trends with the division trends. Uh, and when you look at the US literature, there's a, there's a big chapter 10 problem, um, as, you, as you might call it, where you get to the end and there's not many solutions that people come up with about this. It's kind of once you start it, it's very difficult to stop. And and most of them do end up, as Jane is, is sort of pointing to there, um, calling on the virtue of the key actors to be, just be better in in this that we actually have to have an appeal to the better nature of the key drivers of this whether that's politicians or media and and I've sort of become less ashamed of saying that I think because I do think that is an important aspect and it relates to the two final questions of uh, that I'm going to pick out from the audience's question so one is do you have any thoughts about how we might reinvigorate an ethic of public service in our political and public institutions and is that worth doing and then how we discuss this is very important too. So uh, final question is to have a more intelligent public debate, we need public spaces in which this can take place. Where do you think those can possibly be at present? So it'd be great to, um, maybe actually if I come to Jane first for any reflection, then we can finish with Gary's thoughts on that and any other final thoughts. You might be muted. Sorry. Yeah. Um, great questions. Really difficult to answer. I think if we think about, so I, I guess I still think about what are the drivers here? 
And therefore, what are the things that we might want to address? And so many of the drivers of the fragmentation of support for the political parties, a loss of trust, a lot of a loss of engagement with politics are to do with generational change, uh, to do with younger generations coming into the electorate, having a poor, you know, either a, a, a poor first exposure to politics or also not being socialized into the same kind of different political attitudes that their parents held and their parents before them and their parents before them. So we have to think about this intergenerationally and we have to we have to then worry about the kinds of intergenerational economic injustices that are happening in the world at the moment. So, you know, young people having huge difficulties getting onto the housing ladder and getting the same kind of security that their parents and their grandparents had. So um, this is a really, really difficult issue because younger generations are coming and being socialized into politics at a time when that's very likely to turn them away. Um, at the same time as the, the kinds of issues and the kinds of challenges that they're facing are just enormous economically and also with the environment. So we have to somehow take that, take those frustrations and those grievances and turn them into civic, um, you know, turn them into civic participation. And I, I, it's, it's a question that I can't answer, to be honest, how we do that. But I think understanding that generational change and those, those generational shifts and the kinds of issues and the kinds of concerns and the experiences and the socialization that the younger generations have is really key to to trying to understand this better thank you Jay. Gary. yeah i think that um we're 13 years in to various iterations of austerity and that we need a reinvigoration of the public sphere that you know peculiarly given the sources of the 2008 crash. It was the public sector that was, uh, public sector pay was blamed for it somehow. Um, um, public servants, you know, we clap for them during COVID, but we won't pay them. Um, we have um, uh, privatized pretty much everything that we can, but we're still going. But it's in the public sphere um, that we meet that we can engage that actually you um you you know you're standing in line at the library or you're at the school gate or you're kind of and and um that space has shrunk and it's been um and it's been derided and i, I and i just want to end with really my own story that i was um uh, i had free school members i um had a uh, government grant to go to university. Um, I, uh, my mother was nocturnal epileptic. She was served on the NHS. I got hernia when I was eight. I was on the NHS. These are all ways in which this country supported and sustained me so that I could be where I am now. Now, most of the things that I've just been talking about have gone. Mm. They don't exist anymore. Mm. And uh, the support doesn't exist. The NHS exists, but uh, and I would, you know, I'd still get free school meals, but but I, I wouldn't have had a grant, and I've had to pay fees, and 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 so on and so forth. And that that public sphere does a lot more than just the thing that it's designed to do. It's the glue. It's what keeps us together. It's what allows us to meet. It's what um, you know, whatever. And I may not know a lot, an awful lot about your culture, but we can both talk about that doctor or that school or that teacher. And so um, we, we desperately need a reinvigoration of um, uh, of the, of the public sphere because we know what happens when we don't have it. And the, the coming back to one of the first questions about the states, and here I'll end. I was asked often when I lived in America for 12 years, where would you rather have been born? And I would say, well, you know, three black boys from a single parent family, one of us would be in jail or dead here. But these things that I've just outlined sustained us to a point where all three of us could go to university. That was, in my mind, one of the geniuses of this country, that capacity. Some of it has gone, not all of it is gone but it is vital 
is the vital glue that keeps us together. We pay those taxes, we get those benefits. Those people who didn't pay those taxes but got those benefits, then maybe they can earn some more money and they can pay the taxes next time. So um, um, it's very difficult to have a public engagement when the public sphere is being um, uh, shredded. Hmm. Um, so we need to we need to start there. Yeah, really important point to end on. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, just a couple of quick notices from me and we, we will finish. Um, so a, a reminder that the recording for the event will be available shortly, both on SAGES and the campaign's uh, website. Do have a look at the uh, and follow the Twitter accounts that um, have been put in the post clue for the campaign for social science, SAGE. Um, uh, do have a look at the Election 24 hub. Um, lots of great stuff already up there and much more to come. So do keep an eye out for forthcoming events. Um, uh, and then finally, just for me, a few thanks. Thanks, first of all, to all the uh, attendees um, for taking the time out to attend, which has been a, what's been a brilliant um, lecture and discussion. Thank you to Katie and to Sage for sponsoring and their ongoing support for the campaign uh, more generally. Thank you, of course, to Jane for her brilliant uh, contribution and responses to Gary. And most of all, thank you to Gary. Amazing, amazing session. Thank you so much.